Hello, all. How are you? I'm hearing some voices, but not many. Good afternoon. Oh, come on. What's that cheer we did the first after the first meeting? Go Bucks? You remember Go Bucks? I mean, that's easy enough, right? Can we pull that out today? You know, we have a game tomorrow. Who's going? Woohoo! All right. All right. Are you ready? I have to straddle this thing, don't I? All right. One. You're going to be loud, right? Two. You got a scream in there? Three. That was so bad. One more time. Okay, we're doing we're going backwards this time. We're gonna make it really hard. Ready? Three, two, one. Go bucks! There we go. All right. Okay, so today our special guests are Joanna Sirier, uh, Megan Roberts, I think's first. And then Joanna Sirier from Clinical and Rehabilitative Health Sciences. And then Dr. Judy McCook from the College of Nursing. Okay, so if you guys are ready, we will get started. It's nice to see you guys. Okay. Okay. She's talking. You want to show it? I think it's blank. Okay, we're going to get started. So I'm one of the academic advisors in the College of Clinical and Rehabilitative Health Sciences. Um, we're going to go over our different majors and programs in the college. I didn't flip. Oh. Okay, so the first three are what I'm going to touch on, so cardiopulmonary science, dental hygiene, and radiologic science. They are all undergraduate majors. The next five, Joanna Siria are going to touch on. Nutrition and foods is an undergraduate major and a graduate program. Physical therapy is a program of study and a graduate program. Speech language pathology is a program of study and a graduate program. Audiology is a graduate program. And our pre-occupational therapy is a program of study. So we're going to start with cardiopulmonary science. So this major prepares you to be a respiratory therapist. I do want to show a very short video clip for the career. So we're getting that pulled up. It says it's 20 minutes long. I'm only showing like a minute and 30 of this, okay? Just so you kind of see what the respiratory therapist's career is like. The simple act of breathing is not something most people think about. But if you're struggling to breathe, it's the only thing you can think about. It's a matter of life and breath. You may not know it, but you need a respiratory therapist. The respiratory therapist is one of the most critical members of any healthcare team. In the 24-7 world of medical care, RTs work closely with doctors to diagnose, treat, manage, and educate patients with asthma, emphysema, and a wide range of other respiratory problems from premature babies to the elderly, from the ambulance to the emergency room, from the hospital room to the patient's home. Respiratory therapists are there to help you breathe easy. I just like the fast paced, the anything can happen kind of environment. Nothing. <laughs> okay. Just waiting on the PowerPoint. But um, that's kind of an overview of the career. So um, cardio and the name cardiopulmonary doesn't necessarily mean it's just dealing with the heart. So I get a question, I get questions like that all the time. So cardiopulmonary is basically the entire respiratory system. Um, and again, it prepares you to be a respiratory therapist. So the prerequisites for this include general education requirements, um, your anatomy and physiology one and two, 
Intro to Chem Survey, Intro to Microbiology, Intro to Physics Survey, Intro to Allied Health and Patient Care and Assessment. This is a competitive entry um, program, so <laughs> I don't know what the curtains are doing behind me, but um, you have to get a 3.4 overall GPA and a 3.2 science GPA. You typically apply at the end of your sophomore year, okay? So, next slide. Um, the next major is dental hygiene. So this major prepares you to be a dental hygienist. I do want to play a sh another short little video. Um, the video is from our workshop last year. Um, it's Dr. Debbie Dotson. She's one of the faculty members in the dental hygiene program. Again, I'm just going to show a very short clip. Um, it says it's 40 minutes long. I'm only going to show the first few minutes, okay? But this kind of goes over the field of dental hygiene for you. <laughs> If it pulls up. If not, we'll go. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. I am Dr. Dodson, and I am one of the dental hygiene. I am Dr. Dodson, and I am one of the dental hygiene faculty. And today we are going to talk about the dental hygiene profession, something I know that all of you are obviously interested in. So when you look at the definition of a dental hygienist, you see some key words here. Oral health professionals, prevention, treatment, to protect the teeth and gums, to protect the patient's total overall health. Nowhere in there do you see anything about a cleaning lady, or man for that matter. You do much more than that. You are the person who is the eyes for oral cancer in the practice. If you miss it, chances are it's going to be missed. You are the person who educates the patients. You spend more time with them than anybody else in the office. So if you don't take the time to do a very thorough and effective job of patient education, it won't get done. And you are Okay, again, just a very brief overview, but the prerequisites for dental hygiene is anatomy and physiology one and two, intro to chem survey, intro to microbiology, um, and principles of nutrition, okay? So this is also an extremely competitive um, major to get into. You typically apply at, your, at the end of your sophomore year as well. Um, overall GPA is around a 3.5 or higher, um, and then science GPA is around a 3.3 or 3.4, okay? Um, and then the next major I want to talk about is radiologic science. So this major prepares you to be a radiologic tech. Um, again, a brief video if it allows us to play. <laughs> Looking inside the human body without resorting to highly invasive surgery is the work of radiologic technologists and technicians. They use equipment such as x-rays, CAT scans, or computerized tomography to help prepare patients for tests and treatments. The technician is responsible for properly positioning and immobilizing the patient on the examining table. Sometimes they administer non-radioactive materials into a patient's bloodstream for diagnosis diagnostic purposes. This can be done orally or by injection. Okay, you done shortly. Technicians monitor the video display of the area being scanned, adjusting controls to improve picture quality. Some technologists operate equipment themselves, or they may oversee a radiologic staff, assigning duties and supervising the work. They may work with the facility's administration to develop operating budgets and to help in deciding what new equipment to buy. Technologists work with infectious and radioactive materials. They are responsible for ensuring that radiation safety measures comply with government regulations. Okay, you can breathe. Training in this field ranges from one to four years. This is a profession with better than average growth. With a large aging population, demand for diagnostic imaging will increase. Hold on. Yes. Hi, I'm Rosanna. I'm going to be taking your test, that's right. Okay. 
not to be overlooked is the importance of the human side to the job. These procedures can appear scary, especially to children and the elderly. A friendly, reassuring manner is almost as important as technical expertise. Okay, more often than not, as a rad tech, you are gonna graduate and typically work with x-ray equipment. You can specialize post-graduation in specific modalities. So um, we do have online certifications in CT and MRI. Um, however, we do not have sonography here. So I get a lot of questions about, I wanna be an ultrasound tech when I graduate. There are online certifications out there, but ETSU does not have one. So just kinda keep that in the back of the mind. Um, and we can talk about that in person in a little more detail but um, the prerequisites include general education requirements, anatomy and physiology one and two, intro to chem survey, intro to microbiology, intro to allied health and patient care and assessment. Um, typically you apply at the end of your sophomore year, 3.5 overall GPA and 3.3 science GPA. So um, most of the majors that I just touched on, actually all of them, these aren't typically your backup plans, okay? So um, if you're trying to get into medical school and pharmacy school and your GPA is kind of dropping off, just kind of keep in mind these are still very competitive programs. Um, they're something you can finish, get a bachelor's degree, and enter a specialized field. So they're very appealing to a lot of students, and I'm the advisor for all three of them, okay? So I'm gonna pass this off to Joanna. Hello. Okay, I know it's Friday afternoon, y'all, seriously. It's all good. Hi, hi, thanks. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna talk about nutrition and foods. So first of all, let me say that I am not the advisor for nutrition and foods. That is Julie Mills, and she was not able to be here this afternoon. But I wanna tell you a little bit about that program. Number one, um, average entering GPA, okay? It is also a competitive program. The average entering GPA is about a 3.284. Um, applications run the same way, sort of, that the other programs that Megas just talked about do, and that is the applications are usually due in March. Um, usually you do that kind of at the, the March of your sophomore year in a perfect four-year world. Um, and that would, if you get accepted, then you would start those classes in a two-year cohort, basically your junior and senior year, okay? Um, the majority of students in the nutrition and foods major will go on to do one of two things. They either go on to get a master's um, in clinical nutrition and or do a one year dietetic internship in order to become a registered dietitian. So the great thing is though with this major is that it's fantastic for other healthcare fields. So for those of you who may be interested in med school, pharmacy school, PT school, um, PA school, those kinds of programs, the courses that are within the undergraduate major for nutrition are very similar to what you're gonna have to have to be able to apply to those programs. So if you haven't picked a major yet, if you're not really sure what's going on and you'd like to have a fairly steady um, plan B, especially if your GPA is high, then um, this may be a really good option for you. Um, there are some prerequisites here. We do have the combined AMP one and two. However, if you're pre-PA and you have to take the separate AMP, they will take that. Um, additionally, you have like chemistry um, one, chem two, introduction to nutrition, uh, principles of nutrition and stats. Um, you have to be strong in the sciences, in particular chemistry. You're going to have organic chemistries here. You're also going to have nutritional biochem and microbiology. So you really need to be strong in the sciences to be ready for this field, okay? But it's a great program, um, and it's growing, and we have this really awesome kitchen lab that's over in Hutchison Hall. You all should come check it out sometime. It's amazing. Okay, now we talk about one of my babies, which is pre-physical therapy. Okay, let me ask a question. Who in here wants to be a PT? I see more than one hand and it's amazing, yay! Who's ever been to PT? There it is, okay. So, pre-physical therapy, what we have here is we have, what my job is, is I work with you on the pre-professional program. A lot of you are coming to me for four-year plans and that's amazing, but I can't do them because pre-PT is not a major. It is a program of study where you're going to be pursuing your program of study in preparation to apply to physical therapy school. Now that we also have here. We have a doctorate of physical therapy um, that's actually housed over on the VA campus. 
And basically, there's some things that you need to know about the program in general. First of all, these are our prerequisites to apply to ETSU. One big thing you need to know is that this is only true for ETSU. A lot of students want to apply to more than one school, and that's amazing, and that's fine. Um, and you need to do research on your schools. So we can sit down and talk about that if you're interested in pre-PT. Whoop, hold on, sorry. Okay, so average entering GPA. The, we, rec we look at two GPAs. First of all, it's your overall GPA, which are all of the college courses you've ever taken. And the average entering GPA for students who got in was a 3.67. And then we look at the prerequisites. So those were those biologies and chemistries and physics and stats and psychs and all that good stuff. That, our prerequisite GPA average is a 3.65. This is not a plan B. Okay, you need to be really strong in sciences and you need to be really passionate about this to get in. Um, usually um, a three, says 36, whoops, left out the decimal point there. 3.6 or above is the most competitive. Okay, that's ideal. But 3.4 to 3.6 is still good, okay? Below a 3.4, eh, we can talk about it, okay? Um, you apply in the summer between your junior and senior year to start anywhere from a year to a year and a half later. So you apply really early to be able to get into these programs. Um, right now, we took our biggest class ever, which was 40. Um, it's been 36 for a long time. Um, so shadowing is also super important for these programs. Really, we're looking for three different types of shadowing, and that's your outpatient shadowing, which is like clinics where you go in and you know have your appointment and go home at the end of the day. Um, your inpatient or acute care, that's going to be your hospitals or your rehab facilities. And then skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes. Ideally, we want to see that you've got shadowing in all three. Please read the bottom. Choose any major you want. Seriously. It is not a part of the equation for PT school. I get this question all the time and people don't people look at me like I'm like crazy. No, seriously. If you want to be pre-PT, if you want to go to PT school, pick the major where your skills and interests and talents lie and that could be a possible good plan B for you should you not get in. Okay, that's not to scare you, but that's to let you know that you have that freedom to do that. Okay, um, another program that I advise for is pre-speech language pathology. We have an audiology program as well. Um, I do not advise for that program, and I'll give you some contact info at the end about um, Dr. Smirzinski, Smirzinski, who does advise for the audiology doctorate. But um, basically, uh, we have a Master's of Science degree in Communicative Disorders with a concentration in speech language pathology. And then we have a Doctorate of Audiology. Um, for the 2013 year, which has been pretty much steady, the average entering GPA for the last two years of college for SLP is a 3.81. That looks really high, and it is. Nationwide, this is generally the average for SLP. This by far may be the hardest program we have to get into. Um, the overall GPA average for students who got in was a 3.74. So basically the way that it works is you apply in the fall of your senior year um, for the following fall. And this year we took 32 seats, uh, or 32 students to fill the seats in our SLP program this year. This is for speech language pathologists. Um, I say SLP like everybody knows what that is. Speech language pathology. Those are your folks who are working as speech, um, quote unquote, therapists in schools, but also in hospitals and in nursing homes. This is a very, very broad field. And so most of our experience, unless you've actually worked with a SLP, is in schools. But I'm telling you, this is a huge booming field that's very, very broad and very diverse. So our prerequisites for the program, we have a minor that is required here at ETSU, and that's our communicative disorders minor. Um, and those courses on the top are basically the minor, the CDIS courses. And if you're interested in SLP, you come talk to me, we can talk about the way that you have to take the classes. Additionally, you have to have three credit hours in biology, and we do accept the non-majors, so you don't have to do biology four majors. You also have to have three credit hours in the physical sciences. You don't have to take Chem 1 or Physics 1. We will take Chem 1030 or Physics 1030, which are lower level ones. Um, and you have to have statistics and some social and behavioral sciences. Additionally, the shadowing is huge again. You've got to have some clinical observation hours um, and you have to 
shadow a um, certified SLP, and 25, is, 25 observation hours is the minimum. Again, major in anything you want. It's not really part of the equation for our program. Okay, that's not necessarily true of all SLP programs. But for ours, it's, you can pretty much major in whatever you want. Some of the more popular majors, though, are up there, which are the social and behavioral sciences, communication studies, early childhood development, um, and generally the education majors are the most common. But you can major in business or whatever you want, doesn't matter. Audiology, um, I'm going to send this PowerPoint to all of your instructors because there are some videos and whatnot, and then that way you can go and look at our audiology site. Audiology is a field where um, you're working with hearing, okay? These are the folks who are going to be um, working in audiology clinics. These are folks who are going to be putting tubes in your ears. These are folks who might be working with um, hearing loss. So if you're interested in this field, we have a great program for it. Um, and again, at the end, we'll, I'll share that information for the contact on audiology. It's a very, very small program, but it's a four-year doctorate, and it's a great field as well. Last but not least, um, occupational therapy. So we don't have an OT school here at ETSU, but we offer services for pre-occupational therapy, which again, is where we're gonna help you figure out what it means to be competitive for OT school and help you with research and applying, okay? Um, so advising, this is what I do. Um, I'm also do the work with the pre-OT students. Um, we research schools, know what questions to ask, and um, I help through application. And I wanna see if I've got enough time still left. And I do, I have lots of time. Okay, we're gonna watch a quick video um, about what exactly is OT because I get this question all the time of, well, what is, what's the difference between a PT and an OT? I don't really know. Well, I can tell you this about PT, and the OT will tell you, the video will tell you more here, but with PT, what you're really looking at is overall big giant muscle movements, okay? Um, walking. Um, you know, lifting your arms above your head, having strength, having range of motion, all right? OTs do something a little bit different, so I wanted to make sure that you all knew the difference between the two. occupational therapist at Therapy Playground. Today we're going to discuss some of the commonly asked questions we get as occupational therapists. The first one, what is occupational therapy? Occupational therapy is a form of therapy that works with people to help improve their functional independence on activities of daily living. That's the textbook definition. Um, we help people to get better to do the things they have to do every day. Exactly. Uh, what? How about OT versus PT? It's a great question, especially working in the, the pediatric environment like we do. There can be a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities between occupational therapy and physical therapy. But in general, OT versus PT, occupational therapy is going to work on, again, those functional independent skills, helping people to become better at feeding themselves, become better at dressing themselves, navigating um, what they have to do during the day as functional independent individuals, whether they have a hard time after an injury and recovering from that injury or from that surgery, or as children developing these skills that they just seem to be stumbling over some obstacles. Physical therapy is working more on the physical mobility of those things, navigating a person's environment, um, getting to and from where they need to go while they're doing what they need to do. One of the questions that I get most often is, uh, why does my child need OT if they don't have a job? People might laugh at that question, but it really is not a bad question, and if you're not familiar with what OT is, it makes sense. People hear occupational therapy, they think occupation, they think job. Um, think of occupation in terms of your job of living. OTs help you to be the best that you can at your job of living, no matter what you have to do during that life. Um, what ages and diagnoses do occupational therapists work with? Occupational therapists can work from newborns up into people at the end of their life. 
Um, we can work with newborns in the NICU after they're born with feeding difficulties, or we can work with um, toddlers and preschoolers learning to develop new skills, work with school-aged children, we work with children who have developmental challenges, we work with children who have, again, recovery from a broken arm or an injury or a surgery, we work with adults recovering from injuries or surgeries, and in the, with the, geriatric, the geriatric population, again, recovering from an injury or, um, or an illness. So really, OTs work from newborns all the way to the end of life. Excuse me. Um, do OTs work with just handwriting? Yes. Yes. Pediatric? No, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, oh, handwriting is a, a primary component of what pediatric occupational therapists do because pediatric OTs tend to focus on functional hand skills. And as a child, um, particularly a preschooler or, or school-aged child, OTs need to help those children learn how to write. That's just a, a huge um, component of what they do every day at home and in the classroom. But OTs can work on feeding, learning, helping the children to learn how to feed themselves, helping them to learn how to dress themselves, helping them to learn how to um, improve visual motor skills, um, even just basic play skills, um, manipulating tools and objects and toys in their environment. Um, this is a question that you're going to ask later, I think, but sensory concerns as well. So there's really a whole bunch more than just handwriting that OTs do. Now, I know speech works um, with... Okay. So one of the things that I kind of want to point out here, let me go back to my PowerPoint. Whoops. Um, give me just a second here. There it is. Okay, so one of the things I want to point out to you is that there are some big similarities as far as schooling between um, OT and PT. Shadowing, again, massive. It is so, so important that you shadow. And OTs can be kind of tricky to find. Um, so, and I don't mean that because they're, they're in short supply. That's not the case at all. But there's not a whole lot of outpatient OT clinics. There, are, there actually is a pediatric one here in Johnson City. Um, but generally, you're going to find a lot of OTs in physical therapy clinics. You're also going to find them in schools. You're going to find them in hospitals and rehab facilities. So they kind of um, are hidden amongst other locations versus, say, like a PT where you can Google PT clinics and there's, you know, 30 that show up. So my advice to you would be is that if you're thinking OT, first of all, come in for advisement, come see me. Okay, we'll sit down and talk. But secondly, go shadow an OT. If you're a PT person and you're trying to decide, well, you know, I, I don't really know which one I like better. Go shadow both because there is a sizable difference between the two. As far as majors go, I get this question all the time. For OT, again, you can choose any major that you want. Generally, I find that most of my OT students kind of gravitate towards a few different majors, um, but you can choose any major you want. It does not matter, okay? So um, the takeaway basically from everything today is that we're here, we're on campus, we have programs that you can potentially apply for and get a license for upon graduation. We also have professional programs as well, but we are super dedicated to healthcare. We're, we're here. Please, if you have questions, if you don't understand what we talked about today, if you're at all curious in anything that we have, come talk to us. It may be exactly what you need, it may not be, and if it's not, we'll help you find where you do need to go and we'll get you in contact with those folks, okay? These are our contact information, though. Megan Roberts is at the top, and again, she's radiologic science, cardiopulmonary science, and dental hygiene. Julie Mills is nutrition and foods. Um, I do pre-PT, pre-OT, and pre-SLP. And then Dr. Yasek Smirsinski does audiology. Okay? Does anybody have any questions or concerns? I realize I'm asking a big, giant room of folks to say, hey, I have a question. But really, they may have any questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. If you all have any questions, please, please, please send us an email or come by and see us. Oh, one other thing. If you are looking for us, our office is way hidden, okay? So we're, we're over in Lamb Hall, which is the most weird building on the campus with three first floors. I did not number these buildings. Um, but we're in room 084, Lamb Hall. So there's this pretty little brick tunnel that goes right through Lamb Hall. Go into that brick tunnel. 
look for the doors that say advisement center and we're the last door on the right. But they hide us. So just if you get lost, let us know. Okay? Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I can I can be loud. Hi, I'm Judy McCook. I'm from the College of Nursing. And uh, Guess what I just broke? I really, I really did, but I, there we go. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. That was a commercial. Good, thank you. Now, this is the right one. Play. Is it going to do it again? Dang it. You know what? I may just start talking about nursing. The new Xbox One S with 4K. Hold on. I'll find a way. Ultra to HD video there. and Blu-ray. Not now. And high dynamic range gaming. The ultimate games and entertainment system. Too funny. My, my kids would really be embarrassed. No, no. How many of you are blamers? Dad, How many of you? Forget it. It's over with. I'm so glad we can edit this videotape. <laughs> when I finally get started, we'll get it going. Okay. Um, I want to start by saying that I have been a nurse for 40 years this past summer. I have a BSN in nursing, I have an MSN in nursing, and I have a PhD in nursing, okay? I'm also a clinical nurse specialist, and just this summer, I got SANE trained. Y'all ever heard of SANE training? It's sexual assault nurse examiner, okay? It's actually a forensic role, so that um, if someone becomes gets sexually assaulted, um, these are specialized nurses that know how to collect evidence. Okay, so that's called a sane nurse, if you ever see that again. Okay, so what do you need to be like? What kind of characteristics do we want to see of somebody that's going to go into nursing? You really do need to be a people person, okay? Um, if you're somebody that just wants to put somebody to sleep and sit there and watch vital signs, that's an option. But um, you really do need to like people because they are going to wake up eventually and you have to talk to them. <laughs> you need to be very motivated, okay? It's hard work. Nursing is not glamorous and it really is hard work. It can be absolutely the best profession you have, but if you don't like people, it could be the worst choice for you. You need to be smart, flexible, sensitive, personable, caring, uh, non-judgmental, and sometimes that's really hard. Um, and you need to be able to know how to manage stress. All right, so I pulled this video up like this one's going to work, right? We're going to all hope. 
But this was um, made at the University of Michigan, and it's a nice snippet of different uh, roles that nurses can undertake. Actually, most of them are in one pediatric hospital. And this is where I got my PhD, so I kind of um, This particular job, you know, you you know, they want to say textbook, but sometimes things don't work in that particular place. You have to always expect the unexpected. Have to always expect the unexpected and be ready. That's what I love about my job too. That I do. This, this is the life of a nurse. We always have to be thinking. One of a nurse, we always have to be thinking one step ahead. <laughs> You had your chance. Okay. Okay. So, what I would recommend is that you go to YouTube and put in, you know, Nurses Week, because they've done a lot of videos, but you can see on this particular one at Michigan where there were so many, these were all pediatric nurses, but they had very, very diverse roles. Okay, so there's plenty of stuff online. Uh, just don't choose anything that uh, looks like nurses in flight or you know that kind of thing, because um, there's some real negative connotations for nursing too. But try to get the ones that have had like you know 300,000 views. Okay, as far as registered nurses go, we always think about promoting health, reducing risk, and preventing disease. Um, we focus on the patient, but not just the patient, the whole family is taken into consideration. And we also nurse the community and different populations within the community. Um, we deal with emergencies, long-term care, and we save lives. Okay, so um, when they did a study of nurses and we're looking at what are the characteristics that really impacted their choice. Um, some of the reasons they say is they cared for a family member, okay? And that made them want to go into nursing. It might have been because they had great experience with those care providers, or it may have been that they had an awful experience and they want to do better. Um, some people go into it for job security and flexibility, um, advancement opportunities. Just deciding you're going to be a nurse is really just the first step. There's so many different paths to go and so many areas that you can specialize in. Um, some folks want it as an opportunity to care for others. It is always considered important work and it can be financially lucrative. Okay, You can get jobs almost anywhere. So I listed um, some of the top careers. Um, you know, in terms of forecasts for the future. And several of these we just talked about. But I wanted to point out ETSU leaders, Dr. Paul Stanton was a physician um, that was the former uh, president of the university. Dr. Wilsey Bishop is over all of medicine, pharmacy, nursing, public health, rehab sciences. And she was actually, she started off as a nurse and specialized in uh, public health. And then Dr. Nolan's wife is a women's health nurse practitioner. Okay. So there's all kinds of leadership roles to go in. Okay, uh, The Gallup poll uh, for the last number of years have been rating the most honest and ethical professions. And nursing has ranked um, in the top uh, the top number one spot for 14 years in a row. 
the only year that they were not number one, they were number two instead, was the year of 9-11 when firefighters were top ranked in that situation. So, but nursing is always looked at as a, a, a very trustworthy profession. And this was published last December. I know it's really hard for you all to see, but um, they gave this questionnaire to lots of folks and they asked, how would you rate honesty and ethical standards of people in different fields? And number one is nurses, number two pharmacists, medical doctors, and all the way down at the bottom are members of Congress and lobbyists. So just so you know, we, we do value our, our healthcare professionals. Okay, I wanted to tell you a little bit about different pathways um, to, to be a, become a registered nurse. Uh, there's a three-year diploma program. Those are the ones that are most closely associated with the hospital. We don't have too many of those just now, but we do have uh, two-year programs and four-year programs. ETSU was a four-year or a baccalaureate program. But at the end of the programs, everyone that completes the program is eligible to sit for what we call the NCLEX exam. Okay? If you pass the NCLEX exam, you can write RN after your name. All right. So where do RNs practice? Okay? So we see over half are still in the hospitals. Um, 30 years ago, that would have been really different. Most folks would have been in the hospital. But you see now what a nice slice is in the community, ambulatory nursing homes, and a little sliver in education and we really need people to come teach. Okay, we got, we're ready to retire, so we really need people to become nurses, and in particular, people that, that wanna teach. Let me just see a show of hands. How many of you all wanna be nurses in this group? Okay. Um, there's a huge shortage in nursing. There's a tenfold shortage in nursing faculty. Just tuck that away somewhere. Okay, men in nursing, about 10% of RNs are males, um, but about 20% of nursing students are men. And I um, teach accelerated students in the summer. Those are folks that have a previous degree, either bachelor's, master's, doctoral degree, and they decide they wanna come into nursing. One summer, 40% of my class were men. So we see a lot of them come, you know, coming into the profession. It's something they, you know, they had thought about doing some time ago, but had taken another path. Okay. So just want to highlight some of the things you can do. Um, you can certainly be a critical care or ICU nurse, uh, work in the emergency department, forensics. Um, you can use that to collect a sexual assault exam information, or you may be working with dead bodies and collecting, you know, like CSI materials. Um, we have a lot of students that really enjoy hospice or palliative care. Um, I was a labor and delivery nurse. I'm a women's health person. Did labor and delivery for years and years. Also worked neonatal ICU, so I really love those areas. Then you can specialize in organs. If you want to do dialysis, if you like doing kidneys, or you know, you can you can get so specialized. Um, nurse anesthesia, nurse educator, we mentioned, nurse executive, nurse practitioner. Any of you all thought about being nurse practitioners? Okay, we have a really. Um, large uh, program that's Tennessee eCampus where we do, it's an um, FNP program that's online. So you take all your didactic information online and then you select a preceptor to do your clinical sites with. And I have all the FNPs for ETSU and I've got well over 200 students. So those are the folks I, I particularly advise, but we have uh, professional counselors that do all the advisement and counseling for nursing, okay? So they can help you with your prereqs and, and all of that good stuff. Oncology, orthopedics, OR, mental health psych, um, any of you are, that are really interested in behavioral health, 
nursing is a really nice avenue for that. We have uh, nurses in schools, and then we have nurses that specialize simply in women's health. Um, as far as job satisfaction, um, in terms of upward mobility, nursing is considered average, stress level above average, flexibility average. Um, I talked a little bit about salaries on average nationwide. It's about $64,000. The top 10% earn above $94,000. And then I kind of highlighted just three cities. And again, look at these are all in California. Um, but folks make, can make, you know, six figures there. I was in San Francisco presenting at a conference, literally walked across the street, ran into a former student. He was making $85 an hour. So uh, anyway, there can be money in that. But you also have to think about where you're living, the cost of living. Okay, so they did a, um, a job forecast, uh, the best jobs projected for 2016. Um, and number four was nurse anesthetist, number six, nurse practitioner, and number 22, registered nurse. Okay. So let's see if we're three for three. Let's see if I can get this one to work. All right. So these are just um, your different resources. I'm not going to try to, but this is a great place to go. It lists all the different positions. Uh, the article and tells you, you know, which ones are projected to pay off in the future. All right. Ooh, I got to do advanced practice. All right, I want to take a look at this. Um, I talked about advanced practice, about different roles. So you finish your bachelor's degree, ideally you'll go practice for a while. And then you can come back to get your master's degree. You can go down the path of a nurse practitioner. You can become a certified nurse midwife and deliver babies. You can be a clinical nurse specialist or do nurse anesthetist, okay? So again, just once you decide you're a nurse, there's still lots and lots of choices to make. And then after your master's degree, we have primarily two different paths for you to take. You can either get a PhD in nursing if you want to do research, or else you can do a DNP, a Doctor of Nurse Practitioner, and they tend to have a much more clinical focus. So I've listed some other roles here. Um, military nurses. Um, we have some nurses that go through school and want to join the armed forces afterwards. So they go through the Navy, Army, Air Force, pays for their school, they get commissioned at graduation, and they go into the service as second lieutenants. So that's kind of a, a cool thing. Um, travel nursing's pretty sexy. Um, you know, fly nurse, you fly into a city, they put you up for three months, you cover somebody's maternity leave, work in their ED, okay? Um, I knew a friend who used to work two weekends a month. She was in Atlanta, and she was a flight nurse. She would fly over to Italy, pick up a patient, spend, you know, spend the weekend in Italy, pick up a patient, fly them back to the U.S., to surgery, spend time there, and she just went and did all kinds of international travel. Um, some folks are doing um, an MSN, a Master of Science in Nursing, and also getting an MBA. Um, healthcare, as you know, has really become a business, and having uh, you know financial skills um, is an important piece of that. Uh, you can be a nursing administrator, we said education, um, occupational nurses, all these big companies, Eastman, all the companies have nurses that are hired and work for them. Um, clinical nurse leader, and then we talked about nurse researchers. 
By 2020, they estimate a shortage of 800,000 RNs, okay? So you can kind of see what's happening here. Um, so there's, there's definitely a need out there. Registered nursing is a top occupation in terms of job growth through 2024. And, well, I don't know why this one will work, but we'll see. you all have any questions? I just want to just have a few other closing comments. Um, everything we do in nursing is with other professions. All those professions that they talked about in Allied Health, I've worked with all of those people. Um, the, the buzzword now is to always think interprofessionally, okay? Um, in the past, we used to kind of be in our silos and say, that's my job, that's your job, and now we're looking at things very differently. Who is it that can best meet that need for the patient? So think about that, and the other thing I want you to think about is trauma-informed care. It's something that you'll be hearing more and more about um, as time goes by. Um, but patients that come to us have been traumatized usually in some way, and our job is to make sure we are not re-traumatizing them, okay? We want to make them feel safe, we want to make them feel secure, and one of the best things to do that is to use education, okay? Make sure you tell them what it is you're going to be doing to them, okay? 
Any questions? Um, some of you all, how many of you all are going to apply to medical school? Okay, half of you. Okay, I will see half of you in nursing as well. Um, because sometimes folks um, go into medicine and realize, oh my gosh, this really is going to take, you know, a long, long, long time. So some of you all will, will choose other professions. I'm involved in doing interviews for medical school. I'm on that committee. And um, I look forward to, to getting to meet you there. I also teach interprofessionally. In the fall, I teach communications with pharmacy, medicine, and nursing students. How many of you all are in pharmacy? OK, awesome. Um, so we do a lot of interprofessional work. If you ever get the opportunity and you get to make choices in your classes, always choose an inter interprofessional track, okay? Medicine and pharmacy, you guys are already going to be doing interprofessional communication. But for nursing, you actually have to choose that option, okay? Are there any questions I can answer? Is there anything else I can wow you with with my YouTube videos and and them you know working very smoothly? Okay, thank you for your patience on a Friday afternoon, and good luck in your careers. <laughs>